Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, got, I got on a real rant this week. <laughs> you know, you can understand from my sermons what I've gone through for the week, right? <laughs> I'm a topical speaker, so whatever I talk about, I've dealt with that this week. And um, I, I tried so hard. The last couple of weeks I've been talking about putting effort into your faith, you know, and, and do you actually really try to forgive somebody or try to love somebody that's not lovable? And this week I struggled with trying to forgive somebody and trying to love somebody, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I, I what I call, toiled in my faith. I put some work into this thing, and it didn't work. <laughs> So I'm going to have to keep doing it. And God will make it right when the time is right. And I don't want you to think that I'm some godlier than anybody else person. I struggle with these things too, but we can put some effort into it. We can pray about it more often. And I I even find it hard to pray for somebody that I have a problem with. And I, I don't know, you guys are probably better at this than I am, but the... The act itself, to sit down and pray for somebody that you don't like, is hard. But we're supposed to do it. And this is what I mean when, you, when we have to toil in our faith. What, what's actually happened to our world is we want to find fault in somebody. And we will do a lot to find it. And I've been on both sides of this before. If somebody... If you're introduced to somebody and they say, oh, this person is really good and stuff, and, and maybe you're feeling like they're a little better than you are, you'll start to look for their, their faults. And we actually will take somebody that is a very good person, and if we have a little something against them or don't like something they said, we will find this fault and then we will spread it around. We, we actually like to find fault in people. And as Christians, I don't know how we can say that. And I'm standing up here and saying it. I've done this too. And, oh, you know, you hear somebody's really good at something or, or they're, they're very wealthy or something like that. And I'm, you know, they're still just a person. And uh, I don't know what all the hype is. And you'll actually look for something until you find it. I had a person once, and I'll talk about me so nobody's offended, right? I had a person once that I could tell wasn't all good with me, and they, they kept questioning me about starting the church and, and who was behind all this and who, was I, who sent me and all this stuff, and I could tell they were trying to find something. Well, I'm, I'm a smartass once in a while. Oh I, oh, I said that in church, didn't I? Somebody gasped over here. I'm, I, you found a fault in me. Right? See, that was a setup. Now you can find fault in me. They were trying to find fault. And as I was being a smart Alex, you know how much better I did? As I was being a smart Alec, I said something, and they, they were like, gotcha. I knew it. I knew there was something there. I'd just been waiting for it. And, you know, I just let it go. I could see they didn't like me anyway, and, and instead of trying to explain myself or something, I just thought, you know, just, just let it go. There, there was something they didn't like anyway. Do you ever do that to anybody? You ever find somebody and you actually want to find a fault in them? Or maybe you just stumble across one and say, ooh, they're not as good as I thought they were. You know, as you get into a relationship, right? We didn't, a couple weeks ago we talked about, you'll do anything for this love. And everybody, some people knew about meatloaf, right? Right? <laughs> you'll do anything for love, but then you find out blank. And, ooh, mmm, I don't know if I can do this. It's hard to, hard to forget about. It's hard to forgive. And I want to know how you're doing. Do you actually try to find fault in somebody? Or what do you do with the fault when you find it? We are supposed to be loving and kind. And sometimes we aren't. 
we find a fault in somebody and then we want to tell other people so they don't like them either. We're going to expose their fault. What if you did 50 years of great things and made one mistake and somebody found fault in it and they started to tell everybody? Wouldn't it make you mad? Bob the bridge builder built all those bridges. This was an old joke, so if you're as old as I am, right? But he did one thing, and now he's known as Bob the... <laughs> do you do that to people? Mercy is actually holding back something that somebody deserves. And we're not very good at this. We find a fault in somebody, and we want to spread it around. We want to tear them up. We want to make sure it's not forgotten. And now, of course, we have social media and all this kind of stuff. It's really easy now. You used to have to go down to the coffee shop and hang out down there. Now you can just put it online, everybody knows, and you can block people, right? If somebody makes a comment and says, no, you're wrong, you can, you can delete it. You can block it. We love to find fault in people, and I want you to stop doing it. And I need to stop doing it, too. I hope I'm getting better. But what we do is we find these faults in somebody, and our mind starts to change and let's say it's one-tenth. Let's say there's, there's nine good things and one fault. And you can't get past the fault. What if God did that to you? What if he couldn't get past the thing that you did? We've all done something. We've all got skeletons in our closets. Some are a little drier and dustier and bigger. And What if God said... I'm never going to forget that one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to label you. So I want you to, uh, I think it's Daniel 6. In Daniel 6, they're trying to find fault in Daniel. And they're trying to set him up. And they couldn't find any. Now, can you, can you imagine? I'm not sure I know anybody that good. They watched. And they couldn't find any fault in Daniel. So what they did was they wrote a law. The king wrote a law, a decree or a decree, whatever you want to call it. And it was actually to set up Daniel because they knew Daniel was a godly man. And what they did was they wrote this law that the people had to worship the king's God. And of course, Daniel wouldn't do it. And when they caught him praying to his God, he did it three times a day, a ritual. They said, aha, gotcha. You're going to the lion's den. Can you imagine treating somebody like that? Can you imagine being treated like that? Somebody finds a flaw in you and immediately calls you out on it, starts spreading stuff around about you. But yet we do that to other people. And sometimes we don't think we're really doing this, right? We uh, will say uh, things like, well, now we're just going to keep this between you and me. <laughs> How does that work for you, <laughs> right? Maybe as you get a little bit older, it gets better. I'm not sure. I get hard of hearing, so the, the whisper secrets have to get really loud. And my hearing gets really good when they start whispering. <laughs> this is the stuff you want to hear. All that other stuff. All those bridges Bob built. Nobody cares. But one thing. Aha! I knew it. I got gotcha. you. Do you do that to anybody? Have you? Has anybody done that to you? It's bad. What I'm afraid of is that I'm teaching you to be too tolerant. And I, I'm all about this love and kindness, and I talk about it all the time. Fruit of the Spirit. If I don't see some fruit in somebody, I wonder whether the Holy Spirit's in them. And it's not just a one-time thing. It, it's it's got to be a, a pattern. But, you know, we do have to stand up for some stuff. We have to be strong-willed about our faith, about our values, about our morals. And, and to be... Kind and gentle and loving and peaceful doesn't mean that you roll over and play dead and just let somebody stomp on you. That's not what I'm trying to teach you at all. 
But isn't this what happens? Somebody finds fault in us, and then a guy like me says, oh, it's okay, let's just let it go. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think there's a right way to go about doing this. There's a right way to defend yourself. There's a right way to stand up for somebody else. I think most of the parents in here can understand. Um, or, or if you don't have kids, how about your dog? Right? You can do what you want to me. But you do something to Daisy. <laughs> oh, right? I'm taking that Christian hat off and I'm going to put it on the shelf for a little while. And then I'll slip it back on. And don't tell anybody I taught you that. That's another fault. Are you keeping score? Find how many, I'm going to ask you at the end of the service how many faults you found. You need to stand up for yourself. You need to stand up for your values. You need to stand up for your morals. You need to stand up for your heart, yourself. But there's a right way to do it. And a right way to do it can be kind and gentle. But it doesn't mean that you just roll over and just take whatever somebody wants to do to you. That's not Christianity either. And we have become a, a, a church that I think I've taught too much tolerant. Do people need to be called out on their sin? I'm not a big believer in that, especially in a place like this. I am not going to make a list of everybody's sin. I'd have to start with mine. And, you know, mine would be so great, I wouldn't have to even time to get to yours. But, you know, just a passing in a hallway or something, hey, dude, cut that out. Might be a little bit more effective. But I want you to know that being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit in you to bear fruit doesn't mean you're a pushover. Because you have things to stand up for. How about this? Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. It's a proverb. You see, don't get too far the other way. There's this balance of love, and I, I love the, the hippie era. I mean, they, they just about had it right. I mean, there was a few things, maybe they went a little over the top. But the whole love and peace. Oh, wait a minute. Well, that's me. Until you do what? Don't mess with my dog. Don't mess with my kid. Don't mess with my wife. Don't mess with my God. Don't mess with my faith. I don't want you to be a bunch of... I've got to choose my words right here. Uh, never mind. I can't, I can't think of a decent word. Is that fault number three? Anybody keeping score? Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard it... I'm sorry. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, this is Jesus speaking, but I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. How many of you are good at that one? This is what I was trying to do this week. This, this right here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for these people. And you know what? I actually read it over and over and over several times because I don't know whether this person hates me. I hate them. Right? So I needed to pray for myself to, to have God change my heart. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to take this hatred word and you're going to use it against me. It's another fault. Is that four? Eight. Eight. <laughs> Dude, we have math class on Thursday nights. So. He's really finding fault. Do you do that? When you find fault with somebody, instead of spreading something about them or trying to bring other people into your group, do you actually pray for them? What about somebody that's find, find, found fault in you and called you out on it? Would you pray for them? It's hard. 
It's hard to do. We want to pray for all this good stuff, but we don't want to pray for our enemies. We don't want to pray for those that are, are cutting us up, gossiping about us, but we're supposed to. Everybody knows the golden rule, right? I'm going to read it actually out of Luke 6.31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. All right, so let's just think about this for a minute, right? I have a lot of faults, and somebody finds fault in me, and then I turn around and try to find fault in them, and I'll actually give you an example. They'll find fault in me and call me out on it or something, and I'm, I'm thinking in my head, do, do I see the Holy Spirit in them? How many times have you heard me say this? I'm looking for the fruit of the Spirit in them. Well, there's no love there. Uh, there's no joy there. Uh, you know what? I don't think they got the Holy Spirit in them. Now I, find, I found fault in them. And this just magnifies. Where are you at with all this? Where are you at with finding fault in someone? And what do you do with it? Let, let's, let's just say you just kept it captive. What, what if we all just did that? Okay, we found fault in somebody. And it's not harming anybody. Or it's not um, a violent crime. Of course, we don't roll over for that, right? Could you just keep your mouth shut? Can you? Can you do that? It's called mercy. This is holding back what you think somebody else deserves, and you found fault in them, and you believe that they deserve me to tell other people. Aha! I knew they weren't all good. And I'm going to let everybody know. In fact, I'm going to try to find just as big a group as I can. And we're all going to get together. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cancel you. Huh? You know what cancel culture is? Right? Here we go. I'm going to find another fault because I'm going to talk political here for a minute. Cancel culture. I could be wrong. I'm old. Cancel culture is finding an issue with somebody. And regardless of what they've ever done before, you get a group of people together and you gang up on them and you tear them apart. Socially, publicly, you cancel them because you found a fault in them. You do understand that's the opposite of the gospel. That's the opposite of forgiveness. That's the opposite of mercy. That's the opposite of Christianity. And, and, and what's happening to our world is our world has turned into a finding fault culture. We have to find fault in people. And then we tear them up. We rip them apart just as much as we can. And the bigger group we get together to do it, the better. How can this bad be happening? How can this be happening in the church? That's the cancel culture. How about, um, now I'm sure everybody can relate to this, right? Something happened to you at a store, and you'll never go back there again. That employee, or, or maybe the owner, you don't like the owner, but the employee never did anything to you. Or maybe the employee did something to you, so you're going to cancel the owner. That's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. That's not forgiveness. So if somebody finds fault in Abby's singing, it won't come to church anymore, regardless of how good the food is. Right? <laughs> how many times won't you do something or go somewhere because somebody did something to you or you found out that somebody did something to somebody else and you were part of the group they were trying to get together to now what we call cancel them. This is the opposite of forgiveness. And I don't understand it, especially when it goes on in church. I watched this documentary not too long ago about this, this huge church, and uh, some of the people in the huge church made some real bad mistakes. It was morally bad, and it was a scandal. You see, we call this a scandal now. And so now people won't 
uh, listen to their music and uh, won't buy the CDs or anything like that because the few people that caused all this canceled the whole bunch. You realize that's the cancel culture? They found a fault, regardless of how good, what message was put out there, whatever it was, they found a fault and they're going to cancel them. Because of the mistake of one or a few or a part of something, it's no different than you going into a store, not liking the cashier, and saying, I'll never buy anything there again. When the owner and the rest of the employees and everybody else are just the nicest people, same thing. We are a finding fault culture. And I think we're actually looking for it more and more. Somebody did something to us, something we don't like, we are going to cancel them out, and that is the opposite of Jesus Christ. Just think if he did that to you. One of the things that's really bad is we try to cover them up. If I have a fault, I'm going to try to mask it. Oh, you're all looking at me like I'm the only one that does that. <laughs> right? Um, you know, wear the shirt a little longer so I don't look as fat. Um, I'm trying to pick on myself so you guys will, won't be offended by something I say. Um, I can't even look at you. We, we try to do this. We try to make ourselves look better all the time. We try to act better than we really are. We won't do things in front of some people that we'll do in front of other people. We put on this facade, and Christians do this the worst. They put on this facade on Sunday morning and come into church, and all is good. I do it too. But I'm going to try to do better, and I want you to try to do better with me. And what really scares me is, is that our next generation is going to learn that this is okay. Will you help me stop them? I think we can start right here. And I think that we have. This, this next generation that's coming up, to me, just, it's scary. It's just uh, out of control. They find something wrong with somebody, and they're going to do this, and now we're tearing down statues. Somebody wants to rename Mount Rushmore because uh, I don't even know why. I don't want to read it because it just makes me mad. And then I'll have to pray for them. And I don't want to, because I'm mad. Mad prayer is not much fun. Right? And I'm not sure it really works very well, because in the back of my head, I'm thinking, get them, God. Right? God, I, I hope their heart changed, but you get them. See, now, now I'm just 50-50, right? I'll pray for you, but at the end, I'm going, mm. <laughs> Are you, are you guys different? I'm just trying to be real here. So now we can start praying for our enemies, and maybe this message today you'll start praying for our enemies, but when you're done and you say amen, you'll just kind of whisper, right? Because that means so be it. That means we're all in agreement. This is why people say amen and amen. It means various things. You say amen, it means God do it. I don't want this group, well, there's other ones, they're spread out in here, to be like that. And I tell you, I see hope. I really do. I see hope that you guys don't even know about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal some stuff to you that you don't know. Maybe you do. I don't know. For the last couple, three months, um, Justin and Tanya Jones have taken, taken our youth and got them together, and didn't tell anybody. And they kept meeting together, and, and now you guys are going to think this is hilarious, right? But I tried Snapchat. <laughs> Do you know what Snapchat is? It just got myself in trouble. I, I was sending pictures to people, I don't even know what they were. <laughs> but they disappear, so... Huh? But then I sent one to somebody, and all of a sudden a thing popped up that said they just saved this. So, oh boy. You see, fault. They saved my fault. Weather's okay, don't worry. We have people watching. 
What if God did that to you? What if God said, aha, gotcha. You're not good. You think you're good. You go to church on Sunday, but you're not good. You can't even forgive somebody. As a matter of fact, you can't even keep it captive. What you're doing is you're taking and spreading it, trying to get as big a group together as you can to ruin the other person, to cancel them, to put them down in society, to wipe them out of our thoughts, of any history, because they did something wrong. And you're not paying any attention to all the good stuff. But as soon as they do something wrong, so these kids have got together and they started a prayer group. And what they did was, well, I'll show you. They prayed for you. That's how they started. Everybody, did you guys get two of these? Or am I the only one who's got two? Everybody got two? And eh, some people. Just your first names of you guys. Wait, let me make sure. <laughs> yeah, that's you guys. <laughs> and they prayed for you. Not knowing anything about you. Not knowing whether you had faults or not. Not knowing whether you've done anything good or not. They just started praying for the church. And you know what happened? They started getting into a habit. I love this. After a while, a few weeks went by, on this group, it would say, hey, there's an accident at so-and-so intersection. Would you pray for them? And they all would thumbs up, and I don't even know what those things are. As you know, I picked the wrong ones. Right? Then they're, they're going back and forth, and then pretty soon somebody else... Um, I think one of them went to buy a motorcycle, and when he got there to buy the motorcycle or quad or whatever, the brother of that person had been in an accident, and he sent out a prayer request on this group. And so it started to broaden from just you guys, and it started to become a habit. This, this is hope. This is the hope that I see, that this will stick with them. So what, what this is all about is, I actually got a list here. No, I don't. What number are we up to now? Ten. Twenty-two people in the group have been praying for you guys. The teens picked all the music for today. And most of them up here, this is their weekend. They're doing this for you. The potluck is for you from the teens. The baptisms, they're going to run that. The music, everything. They even came and cleaned here last night. This whole weekend is by our youth. And you see, this, this is hope. This is what we don't want them to be so tolerant to things that they, they won't stand up for themselves. But I also want them to know what forgiveness is, what mercy is, what love is what it means to be a Christian, and I'm starting to see it in their dialect that they're sending back and forth. Are you guys doing that? Are people seeing any hope in you, in your messages, in your, your social media posts, or is it all just bad? This person did this to me. Of course, you won't say what their name is. It kind of feeds. Now, you all do this, don't you? I don't mean to call you all, right? Um, I've had the worst day ever. That's all it says. Well, <laughs> you see how it just going to cause people to, and then I'll, I'll private message you instead of putting it on here, and then they send other messages and other messages. And it's most likely a fault that someone has found and spreading it. That is the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope these guys are learning, and I'm seeing it, and I want to make sure when they go off into the world, some of them are going to college, some of them are going out to the workplace now, that they don't do this. And you know what's going to happen is, if we don't show it to them, they'll see it less. Are you feeding on this stuff, or are you stopping it? Are you just holding it captive? Will the worship team get ready? What are you doing with something that you get? A fault that you found with somebody? 
something went wrong, something, something they did you don't like, what do you do with it? And even if it's just a couple people together and you say, now, I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. Now you know that's not going to happen. We just got to keep this between you and me. Well, you see, you have already told one person. Why can't you just keep it captive? What is it in us that makes us want to tell somebody else? Is it to damage them? Would, would any of these teens that are in here that's part of that group, would you stand up? Good, good for you. I'm proud of you. I really am. I'm, I'm proud of what you've done. I'm proud of what you've become. And I just want to pray for you before you sit down, okay? Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are reaching some younger people. God, thank you for the hope that I see. And God, I want you to, to be with them as they go out into the world. And I want you to, to protect their heart. I want you to, to keep their mouth closed for them. I want you to in, install in them what the gospel really means, what forgiveness really is, what mercy really is, and let them think about it quite often. And this will be a better world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate it. You guys go off and do this. Try to, try to be Christian-like the best that you can. I'm not any better at it than you guys are, but I see you guys are getting real good at it. Don't stop. Don't erase the group. I think, Tanya, are we going to just stop that group? Good for you. Maybe we'll uh, wait another year and do this again. But I'm so proud of you. Thank you. You can sit down. Uh, the mother Mary was about 13 years old. Some show her about 15 years old. That's about how old you guys are. King David was a lowly shepherd. He was a teenager. How about Joseph in the, uh, the coat of many colors? He was just a young man. And look how God used him all through the Bible. I think there's like 70 young people that are throughout the Bible that he used. And he can you guys too, and I'm seeing it. Don't ever forget about it. So as we send them off, I want you to know this. Put up um, John 1, 12 through 13. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Do you see in that passage where it says he gave the right we live in such a world where everybody knows their rights. And you don't have a right to just have eternal life. He gives that. What if he looked at you and said, Nope, I know what you did, and you're done. Never going to forgive you. Forgiveness is so hard. If you look at, at photographs of, of Jesus hanging on the cross, the blood, what happened to him, the, the torture that he went through, you'll see how hard forgiveness can be. If forgiveness was easy, he could have just snapped his fingers and said, there you go. Wouldn't have meant anything to us. It's hard, and you have to toil over these things, and I'm still working on it too. Put some effort into it. But if we get them started at this age, at least we can start in our own community, and we can see a difference that it's making. Don't ever stop. Just keep remembering you're supposed to forgive, not cancel. For those of you that are well-read in your Bible, I'm going to throw out a name here, and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. His name is Thomas. And everybody knows him as... Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. <laughs> All the stuff he probably did for the kingdom of heaven... We all know him as Doubting Thomas. Do you do that to anybody? This guy, I feel so sorry for him. 
This is the number one selling book of all times. And he's in here as Doubting Thomas. Where are you at? What are you doing with stuff that you know? Just because you find fault in somebody doesn't mean you tell somebody else. It means you ask for forgiveness for that person. Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's just about dead. And he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to show us what it's like to be able to be in your kingdom. The example you set for us is amazing. And help us do better. We all struggle with some stuff. And I know that you're a loving and forgiving God. And we need to be the same way. Thank you for another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance. Because you could annihilate us with your wrath at any time. Thank you and help us to be more like that. In Jesus' name, amen.